Okay, um, so please allow me to uh, give my presentation today. Um, it's really about uh, what is happening in the area of economic diplomacy and also in the area of international economic agreements in today's world. I think today's world is really changing very fast. Um, I give you a few examples. President of the United States, Donald Trump, visited China um, in November last year. And you can see Chinese President Xi Jinping shook hand with him. And, and China offered a big, big gift worthy of 253.5 billion US dollars. So in other words, 50% of purchasing American products, including uh, fruits and also high-tech products like Boeing airplanes. Um, and also another 50% uh, is China's uh, committed investments in the United States, in particular in the energy sector. It's worthy uh, a lot of money. So put together, the total value is around 253 billion US dollars. Uh, why this number? Um, it's, it's largely due to uh, the, tr the tremendous trade imbalances between China and the United States. And China uh, is in a position of trade surplus, more than 300 billion US dollars. So in other words, China exported over 400 billion US uh, billion exports in goods to the United States, whereas uh, our American colleagues, friends, only exported um, more than 100 billion products. Not services, but products towards China. So there it remains a huge trade imbalances in China's favor. So China wants to compensate uh, for trade imbalances. So that's why um, they signed a big, big deal including 300 Boeing airplanes and 20-year-long 83.7 billion investments by China Energy Investment Corporation in shale gas developments and chemical manufacturing projects in West Virginia. And also China promised to, to, to purchase over 12 billion US dollars uh, worth of American um, um, chip car, chip, uh, chips uh, for mobile phones. So China imagined that China-US relationship would remain calm and happy. But it turns out that we Chinese are wrong. Voila, you see, um, starting on March 22nd, uh, Washington time this year, uh, President Trump uh, signed a memorandum of, of um, preparing for the initiation of a Section 301 uh, investigation uh, upon uh, Chinese exports worthy of 600, uh, 60 billion US dollars. And President Trump threatened to impose 25% ad valorem duties on China's exports of aer aerospace, information and communication technology and machinery products. And before that, President Trump um, has already initiated a global safeguard measures against um, global imports of, of steel and aluminum products, not just targeted at China, but also targeted at uh, Americans' allies, including um, the European Union, um, also South Korea, um, and also at other countries like Brazil, Argentina, and etc. But not long ago, President Trump, uh, he's very smart. He just exempted uh, all the other countries except China. So in other words, no, no uh, duties on the steel and aluminum products from European Union, Argentina, Brazil, uh, and other countries, but only on China. So China felt lonely. <laughs> and we, uh, 
retaliated by initiating um, some measures on American products, many agricultural products, where they only three billion U.S. dollars. Um, but who knows whether China will take further steps. And China believes that the United States uh, action is unilateral because it already said that they are going to impose duties on Chinese exports without really initiating consultation under the framework of the World Trade Organization. And the United States used to promise and used to practice this kind of multilateral consultation within the framework of WTO since 1997. Before that, they often initiated unilateral measures. But afterwards, they uh, refrain themselves um, by having consultations within the well, WTO framework. Well, I was often interviewed uh, in China by, by media people, by uh, companies. Uh, what's going on uh, in the world? In particular, uh, with the chaos uh, in Europe, multiple crises, right? The Euro debt crisis, refugee crisis. And this morning, I, I, when I watch TV, a huge demonstration by taxi drivers <laughs> blocking the entry of the roads towards uh, Brussels, um, and also terrorist attacks in France, in Belgium, in London, in other cities, Britain. So in other words, the world is changing very fast. The, today's world is no longer like the world we are familiar with yesterday. Um, so this is a table basically illustrating the changing paradigms of economic statecrafts by major powers, by the powers rising and by the powers in decline. And we can see um, from the 15th century until the 18th century that the, the spirit of the times at the time um, was, not really, was not liberalism, it was mercantilism. It was really uh, encouraging exports rather than encouraging imports because of the kings um, wanted to accumulate bullion, the silver, the gold, so that they are able to strength, to, to build up big army, uh, armies to fight uh, wars for territories or for religious reasons, right? Like the Habsburg dynasty, uh, the Spaniards, uh, the Portuguese, uh, even the Dutch and, the, and, and, and the, the British Empire, for a very long time, during the period of 15th until 18th century, um, mercantilism was the major paradigm of economic statecraft by those empires. Um, so if you look at the, the left column, their wealth strategy um, by Spain was really to accumulation of silver and gold through mercantilist means. And also in France, it was uh, colbertism. It was a French style uh, mercantilism uh, to strengthen the strength of the throne of Louis XIV. Um, and on the right column, you can see their strategy for accumulating power and exerting power was through the so-called colonialism, old start colonialism, and also old imperialism. Until liberalism as a new type of paradigm of economic statecraft replaced mercantilism, but it was very late. It was until um, Britain eliminated Corn Law and their Navigation Act sometime in the mid-19th century. So in other words, uh, liberalism was really a, a new and late paradigm of, of economic statecraft in, until the mid-19th century. 
And it didn't last very long. It lasted, we'll say, until the beginning of the 20th century. So in other words, mercantilism had been a paradigm of economic statecraft for three centuries, whereas liberalism uh, was a late coming paradigm of economic statecraft. Um, well, we can see that <coughs> until the end of the 19th century, a new type of, a new paradigm of economic statecraft, which I, I would call uh, imperialism, new imperialism, um, replacing um, liberalism. So those great <coughs> powers scrambled for Africa, scrambled for Asia, dividing up China, for example, towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. So this is, that, that is their power strategy. And their economic strategy, uh, for example, take Germany as an example. It was no longer pure liberalism. It was more and more catching up mercantilism to some extent. It's not, was, was not 100% mercantilism, but more and more um, economic nationalism. We know um, Frederick List, a well-known German political economist who criticized Adam Smith, <coughs> saying basically Adam Smith, um, his liberalism <coughs> was only for Britain because Britain at the time was the world's factory and Britain was highly competitive was, was the most competitive country in terms of their manufacturing capacity. Whereas Germany was largely an agri agrarian country, agricultural country. So basically German industrial products, no way competing against British and French industrial products. So that's why Friedrich List, the German political economist, advocated for economic nationalism. He learned a lot uh, from Hamilton, American treasury, the first American treasury. Uh, because Americans also practiced economic nationalism after, they, uh, after some time, when, after they gained independence in the beginning of the 19th century. Well, Woodrow Wilson, he tried liberalism and multilateralism by establishing League of Nations when he became president and when the United States entered into the First World War and, and, and won the First World War. But we know that he failed, right? He failed because the United States didn't join the League of Nations, even though the United States was the founding father of the League of Nations. And President Wilson couldn't convince the Congress to ratify the League of Nations, right? He himself tried to mobilize the strength of the people to exert pressure on the Congress. So, so he, he, he lobbied by going out of Washington, D.C. and talking to the people state by state. And, and he, he was so tired, so, so, so exhausted himself, and he, he became seriously ill. Seriously paralysis, half of his brain no longer working. So he became stubborn. So he couldn't really reach a compromise with those Congress people. And finally, the United States was rejected uh, in the League of Nations. Well, so liberalism, after British-style liberalism, uh, failed in the beginning of the 20th century. Then again, during the interwar period, we are seeing the resurging of mercantilism, economic nationalism, represented by smooth holiday Tariff Act in the beginning of the 1930s, right? I think people here are familiar with that episode of history. Well, only after the United States um, joined the Second World War and this, they, 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 they draw the lesson of the First World War, they draw the lesson that the, of the failure of the League of Nations, the United States that systematically planned to rebuild the world even during the process of the Second World War. So in 1941, they held the Atlantic Conference and had uh, the Atlantic Charter. And also in 1944, the United States, um, they had a very well-known negotiator, a very tough negotiator, White, 
it was the deputy treasury secretary, I think, second hand to uh, Morgenthau, who was a very good friend of Roose uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So Morgenthau was treasury secretary. But intellectually, he relied on White, the, his deputy. And White was the chief negotiator for the Bretton Woods, uh, Bretton Woods Conference in New Hampshire in 1944 versus Keynes, Maynard Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, the chief uh, negotiator of the British delegation. And uh, Maynard, he wanted to, Keynes wanted to promote a, a, a kind of supranational currency called the Banco to replace American dollar. Because he knew he couldn't defend dollar, because dollar uh, def defend pound. Pound was, was weakened because of the, the weakening of the British Empire. So he wanted to propose something new, Banco. And Chinese financial minister, Zhou Xiaochuan, the, the, he, he was the, the governor of the People's Bank of China. Sorry, he was not the, the, the treasury secretary. He was the governor of the People's uh, Bank of China. He proposed something similar to Banco in 2009 in partnership with, uh, with France, with Nicolas Sarkozy in 2009, when um, the United States was, was hit hard by the financial crisis, by subprime crisis. But China's initiative uh, going nowhere. <laughs> there was no way that the United States would accept a, a new supranational currency. They only wanted dollar to be the hegemonic currency. <laughs> so China's efforts in trying something new uh, to replace American dollar hegemony uh, failed, even though China collaborated with France. Well, and White uh, managed to defend dollar to be the, the anchoring dollar, uh, currency after the Second World War. And ironically, uh, White was found to be the top Soviet spy there was no evidence that he, he worked for the Soviet Union during the Bretton Woods Conference. But there were evidence that he, he wrote for Morgenthau a very important memorandum for American strategic position in the Pacific, in the Pacific Ocean. In that memorandum, White said Japan would be the major rival, structural competition and rivalry between Japan and the United States in the Pacific Ocean. So the United States need to prepare for war, and the United States need to impose strict economic sanctions against Jap Japanese war materials, steel <coughs> and petrol. Because at the time, 60% of Japan's steel and petrol relied on the United States for exporting. So that was partially the fundamental reason for Japan to attack Pearl Harbor. So on that occasion, White worked for the Soviet Union. And he was a, a, a diplomat in 1930s, the American embassy in Moscow. Later it found that in his diary, that he had sympathy with the planning economy in 1930s. A lot of intellectuals, had sympathy of the Soviet Union in the 1930s, because at that time, <laughs> Soviet Union economy grew very fast, right? And they become the second largest economy in the world, only after the United States in the 1930s. And within 10 years, through two five-year planning programs, the economy grew fast. Um, and the details for the purge, for the, for the execution, were not really revealed in the 1930s. So people still have a lot of sympathy during that time. Well, I, then we can see that after Second World War, liberalism playing a very important role, becoming the, the paradigm of economic statecraft by the United States in competition with the Soviet Union's uh, planned economy. And in 19, started from 1970s until the beginning of the 21st century, neoliberalism uh, was the new paradigm. Well, Since 2002, since uh, George W. Bush became a president, um, 
I, I would argue that a pure type of liberalism uh, based on multilateralism, coupled with multilateralism, was more and more replaced by neoconservatism and unilateralism. But still, there's a very strong percentage of liberalism by American trade policy. So, so still, George W. Bush, after 9-1-1, initiated, uh, together with colleagues of, of like Pascal Lamy, initiated um, the Doha round, right? But at the same time, George W. Bush, he preferred bilateral trade agreements by negotiating with small trading partners. And also largely because the United States wanted to have very good negotiating position. I think I read a very good book written by my, uh, my dear colleague, uh, Jean-Frédéric Morin. You wrote a very good book when you were in, at ULB, remember? Uh, a thick book talking about bilateralism. Uh, and Jean-Frédéric Morin, Professor Jean-Frédéric Morin was a true member. I, I cherish our friendship and, and thank you for coming. Uh, I, I draw great inspirations from your books and articles. Um, I'm wondering where you are, so, I, so thank you for coming. <laughs> um, well, mercantilism, I would say, whether we can say that um, mechanism is coming back. I think President Trump gave us more and more evidence that the United States is now re returning to economic nationalism. But I'm not 100% sure. I, I think that we still need some time to judge. Um, and on the power side, I believe geopolitics uh, is back. After 911, uh, George W. Bush uh, initiated two unpopular wars. One was in Afghanistan, the other was in Iraq. And, uh, and President Obama uh, initiated, proposed the, uh, the strategy, so-called uh, Asia pivot, later called uh, global rebalancing uh, in Asia Pacific region. Uh, which is not pure economic initiative. We know that the United States, together with its uh, Asia-Pacific trading partners, um, managed to negotiate the so-called Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, TPP. Um, but China is out, right? I... Um, when I was working at the Ministry of Commerce as the Deputy Director for American Affairs, I remember at some time uh, the Chinese government uh, was interested in joining the TPP. And some of my colleagues, both as policymakers and, and, and academic intellectuals, believed that um, by joining the TPP, um, China would have extra pressure for internal economic reform. So in other words, people, some people, not everyone, some people believe that the TPP would be the second round of China's uh, reform and opening up after China's accession to the World Trade Organization in 2001. Remember, China started to request for the resumption of its membership of, of GATT, General Agreement of Tariff and, and, and trade agreements, tariff and duties. Uh, and then China started to negotiate for accession to the, the World Trade Organization established in 1995. And finally, China joined the WTO in 2001. And then there was a period of so-called reform fatigue because after joining the WTO, China had to uh, uh, deliver a lot of commitments for, ref for market reform for liberalization of specific sectors. Um, and for, for some period, for a period of time, in the, in the 1990s and the beginning of the 20th, 21st century, there were huge job losses, huge layoffs, there were huge social instability. instability. So the new president, President Hu Jintao, and Premier Wen Jiabao, um, to some extent, needed some time to digest China's WTO commitments. So overall, China needs some time and to, to relax and more breathing space. But then around 2009, 2010, so 10 years after China's accession to WTO, people are wondering whether China needs more, 
pressure, extra motivation to do more reform and open up. So people are thinking about seriously uh, joining the WTO, uh, TPP. Um, the US response um, was very ambiguous, was very ambiguous. We, we, we received very mixed messages. Uh, the overall tone is that China is not really welcome. If China wants to join the TPP, China needs to pay dearly, very high price. And when President Obama proposed <coughs> TPP, he also sent more troops to Australia, establishing military allies, strengthen military allies with Japan, South Korea, and also uh, strengthen military ties with Vietnam. So that really sent messages to the Chinese policymakers that Asia pivot was largely a geopolitical tool. So in other words, TPP was not pure economic agreement. It had a tinge, a very strong tinge of geopolitics. So that really um, gave Chinese, some, some, some hardline Chinese policymakers uh, good arguments that China should not join the TPP. China should doing something new. China should doing something in parallel. Um, for example, China um, participated very actively in the so-called RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Um, when President Xi Jinping became, uh, came into office, uh, he initiated uh, something called Belt and Road Initiative. It's so a revival of the ancient Silk Road. Um, the Chinese policymakers made very clear that it is not a geopolitical tool. But this kind of initiative comes out really against the global context, context of geopolitics coming back. So people can understand um, it's very difficult, really, to get away people's um, suspicion that one belt and one road has some element of geopolitics. Well, when it comes to geopolitics, it is not necessarily realist geopolitics, right? We know that classic geopolitics, like um, Halford Mackinder's Heartland Theory, Nicholas... Um, What's his name uh, for the rim length theory? Uh, Spikeman, Nicholas Spikeman, um, and also um, Fred Mahan, sea power theory, the, which were labeled classic geopolitics, really large, built upon um, a sea land power rivalry. You know, it's a very, very, very much black or white, right? Sea power versus land power. The, uh, the United States versus um, Soviet Union power, the British Empire versus, versus uh, Russian Empire, the so-called great game for, for, for having an upper hand in Afghanistan, in India, right? So, so this is very old-styled, uh, classic uh, geopolitical theories. And, 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 and some Chinese uh, intellectuals, including myself, we are arguing that we need to go beyond classic geopolitics. We need to create uh, a win-win uh, uh, geopolitics. So in China, geopolitics is not a negative word. It's a neutral word. It's no problem for me to, to, to be consulted with by uh, our policymakers um, when I talk about geo new geopolitics of One Belt, One Road Initiative. That's fine, they accept that. Well, um, so you can see from the 15th century until the 21st century, for a very long durée of six centuries, we are seeing alternative paradigm, paradigms of economic statecrafts. Mainly four types of paradigms. Mercantilism, started with mercantilism, followed by liberalism, then followed by imperialism, and then 
again, liberalism, again, mercantilism, and also Marxism in the Soviet Union and in uh, communist countries, including China. So four types of paradigms alternating and also coexisting. But why? What is behind these alternating paradigms? Why mercantilism, later liberalism, again, liberal, uh, again mercantilism, again liberalism, again mercantilism? Why? Why? It's like a cycles. I think that it's very simple because economy works like cycles, right? Economy goes up, down, up, down. This is American's economic growth rate from 1961 until 2016. So we can see it works like waves, right? Waves, cycles. So you can see um, during Reagan's time, um, so that's 1982, economy grew up, 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 up. That's the George, uh, that's George Bush Senior's time, 1990, uh, 1989, I think, going down, down, down. So he lost the campaign. And when Clinton became president, American economy goes up uh, from here. Here goes up, 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 until nine until two thousand one. So when American economy grows at faster rate or medium faster rate, that means more jobs are created. The Americans are more confident. So they can promote it, liberalism and multilateralism. When the economy goes down, when social problems were not resolved in a nice way, when jobs are lost, easily mercantilism comes back. Um, but I, I don't think this is enough to explain the sixth century alt alternation. I think this picture can give us a better explanation. The so-called counter TF uh, wave, long wave, which lasted between 40 to 60 years. We know that economic waves, they have different types, sometimes short uh, wave, two, three years, sometimes mid-term waves, eight, nine, 10 years, and counter TF wave is long wave. 40 to 60 years. So we can see, but I have to say that this counter TF wave was not accepted by the majority of economists. In other words, the majority of economists refused to recognize um, the scientificness of the, the counter TF wave. <laughs> Me, as a political scientist, find it is a little bit superstitious. It's a little bit uh, historical determinist, but it, it, it has some explanatory power. And in China, a lot of uh, uh, Marxist communist scholars uh, believe so. Conrad TF, he himself was purged by Stalin. He was sent to um, prison and he died. He was a, a Soviet economist in the 1920s and 30s. He, he died miserably because he basically saying that the, the capitalist economy can grow after some down, then up, again down, again up. That didn't have ha, had, ha, appreciated by Stalin, right? Because for, for orthodox Stalin style communist thinking, the capitalist economy will, will be replaced by communism and capitalism was decadent, dying, right? Okay, it turns out that uh, counter TF wave um, um, still has some explanatory power. So we can see uh, so far, we have already um, 
have the first wave of contra TF cycle from the uh, 1780s. Uh, you know, Schumpeter, Schumpeter, uh, the Austrian economist, uh, reinterpreted the contra TF cycles by saying that the, the, the force behind the up and down of the long wave was largely due to the technological advance. So, so for this first counter TF and second counter TF, the up, up uh, was largely because of the first industrial revolution. So for each long wave lasting between 40 to 60 years, consisting of two phases, phase A and phase B. So this is the very first phase. We see um, buoyant economic growth, more, more, more investments, more jobs are created, and, and phase B, economy going down. Um, largely because of excessive investments when the economy was buoyant. Okay, you can, you can see um, the, the, the railway and steel, the second technological advance uh, also boosted the economy. And third, counter TF because of electrical, engineering, chemistry, industrial advance. And the fourth one is, is already see the second, after Second World War, led by the United States in, in petrochemicals and automobile industries. And then in 1980s, late 1980s, and the beginning of the 1990s, when President Clinton came into office, uh, largely due to the new economy boosted by the development of information technology, the US economy goes up again. Well, um, among those economists and political scientists who believe in counter TF cycles, they were still divided about um, what is happening after 1960, uh, after 1970s. So in other words, the people had different opinions about uh, how long the fifth counter TF cycle lasts. Because now we are already 2018, right? So what is happening after 1990? How long and what is the end date of the fifth counter TF cycle was really controversial. People couldn't agree with each other. My opinion, my opinion is like this. Um, well, here, 1990. So that is the beginning of the fifth counter TF cycle. Because of the information technology and the biotechnology, American new economy, so the first phase of, of counter, fifth counter TF cycle. It ends sometime in 2008 because of um, the global financial crisis. Um, and also the neoliberalism was replaced more and more by economic nationalism. So here, global financial crisis, European debt crisis, and so between 1990 and, nine, and 2008, it's around 20 years time. So that's the first phase. The second phase is between 2008 until 2025 and 2030. That's another 25 years. Put them together, it's around uh, 45 years. I think 2025 um, was really um, a transitional period between two contra TF cycles, fifth and uh, sixth. And it happens that for every long wave, the transition period between phase A and phase, phase B is a period of war and chaos. And also the transition period between um, one long wave and the following long wave, also a period of uphill, up upheaval, chaos, even war. So that really worries me, 2025. But 20, 2025, President Trump really liked this, this time. Because for him, 2026 is the 250th anniversary of the founding of the independence of the United States. So he really targeted at a date. He believes that the United States need to re-search, reassert herself. And the United States needs to seize a new wave of industrial revolution, the third industrial revolution. So that is why, personally, believing the United States three, Section 301 only targeted at 
China's high-tech products, aerospace, machinery, information, communication technology. It was not targeted at China's toys, furniture, shoes, textile apparel products. It targeted at China's high-tech products. He wanted China to pay back uh, royalty fees. He believed that China violated intellectual property protection. He wanted to make sure that the United States remains leading technological power in the world after 2026. And this period, because for each wave, you can see different leading country, like in, after Second World War, the leading country become the United States, right? The United States defeated not only Germany and Japan, the United States also defeated the British Empire by ending very, two very important fundamental elements for the, for the empire. The first is the so-called imperial system of preferences, okay. and the pound area, right? So only British pounds, only Commonwealth uh, Alliance of, of Customs Union, excluding the United States. So the United States say, okay, you wanted me to give you power, uh, weapons through Land Lease Act, you need to get rid of pound area and imperial system preferences and accept something multilateral rather than um, regional or plurilateral, but multilateral like GATT, like uh, multilateral financial institutions, which was the result of the Bretton Woods system conference. So, so for the future, um, whether the United States, for this, this, during this period, we're now in this period, so we're now in the second phase, phase B of the fifth contract TF cycle. So the economy grows slowly, not stagnating, but grows slowly compared with previous uh, periods. So grow slowly 2%, 1%, uh, sometimes minus percent. So that's why the surge of economic nationalism. We'll see whether there's gonna be a new industrial revolution. That might help uh, the world's economy growing up again. So here it is global, not just talking about the United States and Europe or China, but it's global long wave. Huh? But this period would be very turbulent. Huh? The second phase, at 2008 and, to, and also this period, 2020, 25, 25 2030. <coughs> Who will be the leading countries? Still the United States, Chinese, the Europeans, or the Indians? We, know, we don't know actually. But this period is really a key moment. Well, if we can manage to survive this period, we'll go to a second phase B. That is 2050 until 2070. Probably the, the sixth contract TF cycle would be the period, the, the duration of the third industrial revolution represented by uh, AI, green tech, skyrockets, and data, big data. So that's um, like science fiction. <laughs> um, well, due to time constraint, um, I cannot explain f fully uh, China's economic statecraft from 1949 to 2018. Um, but obviously, we can see Xi Jinping's time. Uh, China proposed a lot of new ideas of economic statecraft. I call it, this is a wealth power strategy because really, it's a mutual two-way conversion between China's money and China's power. And China can use money for power or use power for money, right? So you can see OBOR, Belt and Road Initiative, China's establishment of Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, BRICS Development Bank together with other BRICS countries, China's promotion of RCEP and also China proposed a free trade agreement across the whole Asia Pacific so as to cover and reconcile the competing TPP and RCEP. And also China proposed uh, a lot of domestic economic reforms like the supply side reform uh, against um, we, we adopted in 2009, the, the very much new Keynesian uh, formula. But 
we closed down factories to reduce China's overcapacity domestically. Because basically, the, whole, the rest of the world cannot absorb China's exports. So um, let me conclude. I think that the overall patterns, the overall reconfiguration of the geopolitics of international economic agreements was largely due to um, the waves of economic growth uh, of leading countries, in particular the United States, and also Europeans, for example, and also China. Um, so there is a very strong economic background behind uh, those geopolitical uh, game changing. Um, in the future, I think that the, the competition uh, would be not only geopolitical competition, but also technological competition. And from now until 2050, 2025, 2030, would be a period of turbulence. So in other words, the trade war between China and the United States is just the beginning of a series of trade wars. Probably not only China and the United States, but other big economies, including European Union. Um, so the whole world economy is being threatened. So at this time, we really need to do something against the historical determinism represented by Conrad TF cycle. We need to um, do our best to uphold multilateralism, but at the same time being creative in developing new regional frameworks for global and regional peace and prosperity. Thank you. Well, um, I think that China needs multilateralism, even from a, a practical point of view, right? For example, Chinese ambassador uh, to the WTO used uh, WTO rules against American Section 301 because American Section 301 is largely perceived um, as a unilateral action against the spirit of the WTO. So from that point of view, China needs WTO. Of course, there was a period of um, suspicion about the, the sustainability of WTO by some Chinese intellectuals, including myself. But the Chinese government uh, is always firm in upholding uh, WTO and trade multilateralism. So in other words, um, the trade war between China and the United States would be an ongoing process, probably lasting for 20 years. But China would not reject, rather China would embrace and uphold uh, WTO and the United Nations, for, for example, and uh, uh, global weather uh, protocol. So this is typical representation of, of multilateralism. I think it is largely because of China's economy still growing at six digit, at six percent. So China's economy still is slowing down compared with two digit growth, but still grows six percent, 6.5, 6.7. So that gives China a, a margin maneuver for, for embracing globalization and multilateralism and gives China confidence. Um, that, uh, helps China continue with uh, multilateralism. That being said, uh, we are in a period of turbulence. So there might be um, big trade wars and also big regional blocks uh, like TPP, like uh, RCEP. Uh, but it's very difficult for China to reject uh, multilateralism. But I have to say that China is not born with multilateralism. Multilateralism is a very new, new thing. Uh, I, I, but WTO is really the first um, eye-opening for China's uh, um, global economic policy. 
that significantly shapes uh, the perception of Chinese intellectuals and policymakers about the world economy. I remember back in, 19, in 2006, while I was uh, uh, trade attaché um, working in the Chinese mission to the European Union based in Brussels, there was a period that the, the, the European Commission um, started to, 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 to rethinking the, the, the viability of, of the Doha round negotiation, whether uh, the, the European Union needs to go uh, through bilateral means. You know, Pascal Ami, uh, the first trade commissioner of the European Commission, later the director general of the World Trade Organization, he, he basically gave up bilateralism. He, he imposed a moratorium on bilateralism. He stopped ongoing bilateral FTA negotiations simply because he wanted to show he, he wanted to, to concentrate all the negotiating power on Doha round negotiation, which he co-initiated with, uh, uh, with American colleagues. But, Pascal, uh, but Peter Mandelson, uh, the succeeding trade commissioner, seeing that Doha round trade negotiation encountered tremendous difficulties, he really wanted to, to be creative. So he initiated a big discussion among the European uh, colleagues saying that whether we should go to bilateral and finally reach a consensus, okay, we go both multilateral and bilateral and regional, but we give priority to multilateralism. So during that period, uh, China was, including people like me as policymaker, really think about whether China should continue with Doha round negotiation or China should also do it bilateral. And when we're doing bilateral, two most important trading partners were number one, the United States, number two, the European Union. So we are faced, we, we, we're really thinking hard about the potentialities of a bilateral agreements between China and the United States and also between China and the European Union. But finally, internal discussion determines that we go with only multilateralism. So in other words, WTO given priority and China EU, China US is not, I mean, FTA is not a given priority. <coughs> so, so until now, we don't have uh, these bilateral FTAs. And once we lost that opportunity in 2006, I think we lost at least two decades. And until now, we don't have uh, um, really strong support from both sides, United States, Europe, or even within China, uh, support for those grand bilateral FTAs. Thank you. For sure that China's trade policy, um, if there's one, If there's a consistent one, actually. Um, but personally, I don't think that China really developing very, very clear strategic vision about uh, 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 trade strategy or trade policy. Uh, I think China is lacking of very clear vision of trade policy. Um, for a long time, until today, I don't think that our policymakers have very clear vision of trade policy. Um, and. China used to have um, um, a top-down uh, initiative, a big campaign for joining the WTO, that's for sure. But after that, you don't see very clear uh, initiative and trade policy strategy. China is not really sure um, whether we should focus our negotiating strength on multilateral negotiation or regional, I mean, I mean the big regionals, or, or bilaterals. For example, if you are very clear with your, your trade policy uh, priorities, for example, you go with bilateralism, then you, you focus your attention on negotiating that, those bilaterals, but you see China doesn't have, hasn't developed very, very good networks of those bilateral free trade agreements. We have small bilateral free trade agreements, like with Georgia, with Chile, with New Zealand, with now with Australia, but uh, not with Canada, 
not with the European Union, not with Japan, we're negotiating that, but it doesn't work, right? If you go with the regionals, you should end RCEP negotiation last year or the year before last. If you go with WTO, if you go with multilateralism, you should be able to really conclude the Doha round as early as 2008. But then it seems that China is a reluctant leader of the, of, of, of the multilateral trade negotiations. And with China's economy slowing down with huge amount of overcapacity, um, with huge pressure on, on, on jobs, job losses, I don't think that China is really in the position for accepting huge amount of liberalization. So that is partially why China is more and more focused on economic statecraft, economic diplomacy. Economic diplomacy is really the buzzword for, for President Xi Jinping, uh, for Chinese government now, since 2012 in particular represented by Belt and Road Initiative. So economic diplomacy means trade and foreign policy is interlinked. It's not 100% for economic purpose. It surely has foreign policy purposes, and these two are interlinked. Um, so in the future for China, trade policy, if there's a one, um, China would very much focus on how to digest China's overcapacity. So in other words, China really needs to negotiate well with uh, global partners about steel, aluminum, uh, about um, machinery, consuming product, electronic products. Um, China can accept a certain increase of imports because of China's huge domestic market. So that is why China 2018 trade policy priority is to, to focus on, on, on imports, to, to organize a huge fair of imports in Shanghai. But this is really trade promotion, not really trade liberalization. Because Canada has already uh, free trade agreements with the European Union, um, and also NAFTA, um, China doesn't want to lag behind. I think this is uh, a, a fundamental uh, motivation. Um, and also, Canada has, uh, has advanced technology. Um, and with the FTA, China can uh, have more advanced technology from Canada. And also Canada is uh, a good consuming market for Chinese electronic consumer products and potentially for Chinese automobiles and also for, for high-speed rails, for even for aerospace equipments. But there is also increasing competition like uh, between Bombardier and Chinese high-speed rail products, equipments. Uh, and also there's, there's issue of, uh, of intellectual property rights. So I would say there's competition, but first co cooperation, cooperation and competition. Um, whether there's some uh, geopolitical element for FTA between China and Canada, well, I think there is minimum not really big. I mean, Canada is not China's neighbor, but Canada is very important in the sense China, uh, Canada is the Pacific and Atlantic, two frontiers, two ocean countries. So Canada uh, 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 is still seen by China as, as, as a power. Um, so there is uh, some little element of, of geopolitics regarding this FTA. I, I would say any FTA uh, would have some amount of, of geopolitics, uh, not pure <laughs> uh, liberal free trade thing. I mean, as a political scientist, I always believe there's 
certain amount of geopolitics in any of uh, free trade agreements. I, I don't know whether we, we conclude, concluded the negotiation with Canada or, or not yet. I mean, the FTA negotiation has been concluded, not yet. Since I have not been involved in the details, uh, so I'm not too sure what are the major obstacles. But we'll do have in the future the chance for for discussions. <laughs>